I want to uh, uh, thank everyone uh, for being here. It's a real honor to uh, be a Fulbright uh, Tocqueville uh, chair. Um, and um, I uh, want to first give some thanks before I, I launch into to talking. I first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, the president, Ji Yomei, for the um, uh, support that you've given me for uh, being uh, here at the University of Versailles. I really appreciate uh, that. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be able to, to come back to France and to work with uh, my, my colleague, William Jobby. Um, I'd like to uh, thank um, the director of the uh, Fulbright uh, Commission here uh, in France. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I think that um, Fulbright is, is something special. It, it really is um, an opportunity for someone uh, like myself to come and to work within a community uh, uh, for academic uh, and research exchange in a, in a different culture. And I think that's what makes uh, Fulbright uh, itself a, a very special program. So um, it's, uh, it's part of what you know, this experience is all about, is being able to meet uh, those within uh, the community, uh, be a part of this culture, and also have an exchange of ideas and, and um, education, teaching, research, and, and experiences. So I really appreciate that. Um, as a Fulbright chair, you uh, get to do teaching. Uh, you get to do some of the uh, interfacing, engaging with students. Uh, that's part of my activity. Also research, uh, but also the uh, ability to, to get out within uh, the community, within the culture, and, 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 and tell you about myself and learn, and learn from you. So that's what I hope to try to do today in this talk. Um, I thought a lot about this talk. Uh, it's been you know, several months and trying to think about what it is I want to uh, present to you. I knew that it was gonna be for a more general audience, so that actually turned out to be uh, a challenge for me to try to uh, figure out how to convey to you uh, what is exciting to me, what I get passionate about when I think about uh, the research that I do. So I came up with this uh, title, From Computable Numbers to Curing Cancer. Uh, this is a talk about supercomputing, as you see in the title. It's also a talk about computing. So I want to start here by uh, motivating this a little bit with Arthur C. Clarke, a uh, famous uh, fiction writer. He has three laws the third of which you're probably most familiar with, or the first two are interesting as well. Um, law one, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he, he is almost, almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Yeah. I don't necessarily consider myself an elderly scientist, uh, but if you look at law number two, it starts to get a little bit more interesting. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. What's impossible? Um, law three, a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I want to uh, tell you that I brought along a little prop. Here it is. And in that box is magic and I'm gonna to try to convince you of such. Um, this is gonna be the outline for the, I'm not gonna tell you any more about it. Don't worry, we'll come back to it. But keep looking at that box. This is what I'm gonna to try to do. I'm gonna to try to take you on a journey uh, of computing. And um, I'm gonna start by talking about computability. Then I'll proceed to complexity. We're going we're gonna to lead up to supercomputing, don't worry. Uh, to do so, we have to talk about parallelism. I have to give you a little bit of background in performance so you understand what we talk about when we talk about supercomputing systems, which we'll do. I've got to come back to performance because I have to tell you a little bit about what I do and what William does. Um, and then we'll finally get to the point where what I call HPC matters, and we'll end with uh, that box there. All right, computability. What's it mean to be computable? What does that mean? Well, the story starts actually back uh, in uh, the beginning of the 20th century with uh, David Hilbert. 
Uh, he was a mathematician. He had a formalist philosophy to mathematics. Um, he thought in terms of these formal systems, and in fact, <coughs> these finitistic proofs from finite, complete axioms, and he was all about every mathematical problem had a solution. That was his thing. He saw at the beginning of the 20th century, a foundational crisis in mathematics, and he tried to establish a program to help to address that, that problem. Now, I should probably start, stop here and uh, ask, uh, how many of you all are computer scientists? I think a fair number in the crowd, and then uh, those who work in science, maybe even a bit more, and those who, who are more in general science or general areas. Well, you're, you're my audience. So if you, I say something you don't understand, you can raise your hand, but we only have a uh, you know, limited amount of time. What's interesting here is that uh, Hilbert in 1900 published 23 unsolved problems. Over uh, several decades, he tried to refine those and they became very precise. What was mathematics complete? Was mathematics consistent? Was mathematics decidable? Um, the so-called Einstein Dung's problem. Well, if you look at that problem, that's a, called the decision problem. Uh, let's take a look at what, uh, what was done to address that. Turns out, Gudo, uh, incompleteness theorems, um, actually refuted the first two uh, of these, uh, these areas of completeness and consistency, and he had a kind of a neat diagonalization argument that I won't go much into, but it turns out uh, that um, two other people, Church and Turing, used this argument in, in their work. Hilbert's tenth problem is interesting. In the 1900 um, uh, version of this, it was basically to determine the solvability of Diophantine equations, and it essentially became what is, we think of as the decision problem. The most general form of this is the following. A quite definite, general, applicable prescription is required which will allow one to decide finite number in a finite number of steps, the true or falsity of a given purely logical assertion. I want you to think about that. Definite, general, applicable prescription. What is that? What is it? What does it mean? What does that mean? It's a process for solving a particular problem. It's a process. In mathematics, this is called an effective method. Church and Turing keyed in on this. They keyed in on this general applicable prescription. Church, in 1936, invented the lambda calculus. And lambda calculus had this concept of an effective calculability the effective method became an effective calculability. He used that in lambda calculus to essentially give a general solution to prove that a general solution to the decision pro problem is impossible. Now, uh, like minds, great minds think alike. Turing, at exactly the same time, he looked at that, he thought about that, he said, you know, what is this effective method? And he showed how to construct an effective method, but he took a very different approach. And the approach that he took was to try to really reduce, you know, to a very uh, simple form what it means to have an effective method. He applied it to this problem of computable numbers. That's where computable numbers come from in the title. And he said a number is computable if its decimal can be written down by a machine, a machine. And by the way, he also ended up proving that this decision problem uh, was uh, impossible. What machine? Uh, a Turing machine. So Turing invented this very simple machine. There it is, right there. And a Turing machine is the following. It's an infinite tape, there it is. Tape's infinite, and that's important, but I won't explain why. It's an infinite tape. At any time, you are looking at some cell on that tape, right there. 
with this read-write head. You're looking at that cell, um, and you're making a decision about what to do. That cell can have symbols written on it. And so the machine says, read a symbol at that location, at that tape head, um, given the current machine state, and that symbol, decide what to do. What can you do? You could write a new symbol or not. You could move left or right one cell or not. You could go then to uh, a new machine state. Okay, so you got the tape, you got the read-write head. Where's the machine state? It's, it's over here in something called a finite state machine. Finite state machine is essentially a finite number of machine states and within a state, you're looking at symbols and you're deciding what to do. You can transition to other states. You can write things on the tape. You can move around, but that's it. Pretty simple. Now, Church and Turing, you know, they did these things at exactly the same time. They realized that they did so um, they talked with each other, and they wrote a paper. And that paper turned out to be a paper about what's called the Church-Turing thesis. And it really has to do with what computability means. It has to do with the nature of computability. And what they found is that, essentially, the Lambda calculus and Turing machines are equivalent. They're equivalent. So the hypothesis was there is no effective model of computing more powerful than a Turing machine. What is effectively calculable, lambda calculus, is computable. Computable in the sense that a Turing machine can compute it. A Turing machine is a model of computation, a very, very simple hypothetical machine that computes things. It is also interesting in that it's universal. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you take a Turing machine that does something, you can actually encode that function, that machine, into some number, something, some number. I can read it into the tape, and then I can get another machine to essentially emulate that machine. A Turing machine, a universal Turing machine, is a machine that essentially can emulate any Turing machine if that Turing machine is read as input. What does that mean? It means that a Turing machine can compute anything. What's computable? It's a Turing machine. Now, there's something really strange about that. It's like when Turing came up with this idea, suddenly, you had, a th you had this model that could compute anything. And it's also interesting because the way that he describes it in this paper is that you are the computer. Let's imagine operations performed by the computer, you. He talks about a person who does these things, he does these steps to be split up into simple operations, which are so elementary, it's not easy to imagine them any further divided. Um, every such operation consists of some change in the physical system of the computer, consisting of the computer and his tape. The computer is you. You are the one that are executing these steps. You are essentially the one that is the finite state machine. He then described how to construct a machine to do the work of, of the computer. Isn't that interesting? And I want you to remember this. So here you have a model of computation. It gets better. It gets better because that model is as powerful as anything else that can compute. All the computers that we have today uh, are essentially Turing machines. 
they're equivalent. They're called Turing equivalent because those machines can essentially implement a universal Turing machine and they have the same computational power as a Turing machine. Turing machine has, the, and they don't have any more power than that. Okay, are we good? Computability, complexity. Computability and complexity, computational power is what can be computed. What is possible to be computed and what is computed is what is computed by, it, it, what is computable is what's computed by a Turing machine. They're as powerful as any other computer system. There's no other computer system is as powerful, any more powerful than a Turing machine. And Turing completeness means that uh, exactly, essentially exactly that. But computability is not the same as complexity. You have computable problems, you have problems that you'd like to compute, and a Turing machine will happily do that for you, but there's a real question as to how hard these problems are. You know, complexity is how hard it is to solve a problem. And complexity theory is when we have a theory that lets us talk about that, talk about how hard it is to solve problems. And we do so with, within, with, with some things that we can say you know, have to do with, with that hardness, like how long does it take to do it? So you know, we think about time and we think about space. How much space on that infinite tape do you need in order to be, be able to compute this problem? So I'm going to tell you about complexity. There are classes of complexity. That is, there's different classes that are of different you know, degrees of difficulty uh, for computational problems. There's something called class P. So all of you are gonna be computer scientists at the end of this lecture here. Class P, what, cla what is class P? It's a set of problems that are able to be solved in a polynomial amount of time. A polynomial amount of time is essentially that you have a polynomial expression for the number of steps that it takes to solve that problem. P, P is great because P can be executed more or less efficiently on computer systems. Here's a problem called bubble sort. Uh, actually, that's not the problem, that's the algorithm. The problem is you have a list of numbers, you wanna sort them in uh, increasing order, starting with the smallest here on the left, going up to the largest. I have a list of in numbers, okay? And they're out of order. I wanna sort them. Bubble sort is a great sorting method. It essentially starts at the left and it moves to the right and any time it finds two elements next to each other and X is greater than Y, it will swap them. And the question is, what's the complexity of bubble sort? Well, that's not bad. Um, Worst case, you have to, you, you're, you're completely out of order, where the smallest is at the top and the largest is at the bottom, and you gotta get them in order. Well, that will take you n squared divided by two. And when we talk about complexity, we, we, we try to talk about it with respect to uh, the, the order of complexity. And in this case, we're using this notation called the big O notation, and Bubble sort has an order n squared. You throw away these, throw away the constants because they don't really matter that much. Bubble sort, order n squared, good. Here's another problem. It's called the single source shortest path problem. You got a graph that has nodes in it or vertices and you got edges connecting the vertices. Okay, there's a graph. This is all the roads in the United States connecting cities, towns, addresses. And the question is, starting at this point, how do I get to everywhere else uh, in the shortest path? Find the shortest paths to everywhere else starting at that point. When we talk about complexity, we, tend, we talk about the size of things. This is pretty big. N could be really large, okay? What do you guess? Is, that, is this in P? Uh, well, Dijkstra, back in 1958, this is an old algorithm, came up with this famous algorithm 
which essentially does the following. It starts at the start and it builds a spanning tree. It adds vertices to that spanning tree that it knows are, the, are on the shortest path, essentially. I'm not gonna go through the algorithm. That's what it does. It adds one vertic, vertex at a time until it has no more vertices left and you're done. It builds a spanning tree to do this. The order of this algorithm um, is square of the number of nodes or the number of vertices. That's the order. It's still polynomial. It's a polynomial expression. It's still in P. Now there's something interesting about Dijkstra single short shortest path algorithm that I'll tell you about a little bit later. But we're just talking about complexity. Uh, there's another class, and it's a, not a nice class, called MP. MP stands for non-deterministic, or the N stands for deterministic. And the problem is here is that uh, we classify MP with respect to being able to verify a solution, if you're given a solution, in polynomial time. But the problem is it's not clear whether the the actual solution to the problem is in able to be done in a polynomial time. So we call that class N, P. Um, and this becomes very interesting uh, because in complexity theory and computer science, it's not clear whether the class of these problems are exactly the same as the class of the P problems. You know, is P is equal to NP is not known in computer science. Here's an MP problem. <laughs> it's called the traveling salesman problem. It also works on a graph. It also works with a starting point. But now, now what you want to do is you want to find a path that goes through all of the locations that you want to go to and then comes back to the starting point without ever going to one town uh, more than once and you want the shortest path. That's, that's hard. That turns out to be uh, known as NP hard, which is maybe even harder than NP complete. This, this problem is hard. So what I want you to take away from this is that you got something that actually computes any problem, but there are you know, problems of different degrees of difficulty, okay? Um, and that's just the nature, that's the nature of computational problems. All right, now it gets interesting, more interesting, because uh, you might think that there are ways in which we could speed up things, you know? Is there ways to speed up things? I haven't really talked about a computer yet, except for a Turing machine, uh, but uh, there is things that have to do with can we compute in parallel? Can we do things, uh, and this is really an issue of, the, of some attributes of the problem, are there ways to do things simultaneously when we're actually solving a problem? So complexity is about when problems scale. It's about what happens when problem scale. What is the complexity, time complexity, of that? But when we start to actually talk about the algorithms, we're talking about the steps that are involved and what those steps do. Um, an algorithm has complexity that really tr basically boils down to the number of operations or the number it takes to actually do something, okay? So I'm gonna make a distinction between what I call operation, which are what needs to be you know, an operation, it's something that needs to be done, and a step. A step is a step in the algorithm. A sequential step is when I can do only one operation at a single time, at, at a step. If it's such that every single, st every single step that I do, I can only do one operation, this whole algorithm is sequential because I just do one operation right after the other. 
That's the nature of the algorithm. But there are algorithms that are parallel. What does that mean? It means that at some steps in that algorithm, I can do a lot of operations. Okay? It's the algorithm, it's the problem, it's the algorithm that de determines whether there are parallel characteristics in the execution of that algorithm. Okay? And how do we know? Well, we know because there's something having have to do that has to do with the problem where there are dependencies between the steps. If there are dependencies between the steps, I have to, I have to satisfy those dependencies. Now, Dijkstra's single short shortest path algorithm is inherently sequential. It's an inherently sequential algorithm. Why? Because I have to find that next vertex to add to my spanning tray. And it's only one of them. So I build this tree one vertex at a time. And I add a vertex because the next solution might actually depend upon that vertex. All right, that's a little bit too much. Let's simplify it, make it easy. Let's, let's I'll give you a problem. Here's a problem, adding in numbers. Everybody can add in, in numbers. It's easy. The sequential algorithm takes those in numbers and just adds one, then adds another, and then adds another. And so you have a, you know, you have a, a partial sum all the way to the end, and then suddenly you have your solution the sequential algorithm takes n minus one steps. But I look at this and I ask you, can that be parallelized? Sure, here it is. But this is a trick question. Can this algorithm, this one right here, be parallelized? No, you need a new algorithm. You need a new algorithm. That algorithm is to build a binary tree, basically, and compute um, partial sums at each level until you get to the end and you're done. That algorithm uh, has, if you had an ability to execute as many operations as possible at any step, that algorithm is log two n for n numbers. Isn't that interesting? So when I think about computing in numbers and I think about doing it in parallel, it is the nature of the algorithm that determines whether I can do that in parallel. But you might think, well, how do I do the operations in parallel? Well, you got a Turing machine. Maybe you can have a lot of Turing machines that are doing these operations in a single step. It turns out there's theory, there's theory behind parallel computing too. And it's how you represent the speed up that you get when you add parallelism to a problem. There's two types. I'm not gonna have you read these slides. I'm gonna just tell them to you. There's two types. One type is where I have a fixed size problem and I can't, I can't do anything to make it bigger, I'm looking at that problem, uh, like in numbers to add. And then I look at it and I ask myself, what needs to be done sequentially because I have dependencies and what can I do in parallel? The interesting thing about this, this is called Amdahl's law. The interesting thing about this is that the piece, the fraction that is sequential it limits the performance in a very serious way, in a serious way. When Amdahl came up with this law, this so-called law, the parallel computing community kind of freaked out. They said, uh-oh, you know, this is not good. And why is it not good? Because I take a fixed size problem and I say to you, 5% mm, of this I have to do sequentially. 5% of this problem I have to do sequentially. The problem is that if I say, I'll give you an unlimited number of processors for the parallel part, that essentially goes to zero. This piece, this fraction of that problem limits your speed up in a big way. If it's 1%, if it's 1%, the asymptotic performance improvement speed up is only 100. 
And why did the parallel computing or supercomputing community freak out? It's because they're trying to build these big systems and suddenly you're telling me uh, that my problems don't scale. And that's a problem. So what do you do? Uh, some folks, uh, John Gustafson and uh, uh, Barthes came up with an idea of scaled speed up. It says, you know, it's stupid to have fixed size problem when you got some big machine why don't you just make the problem bigger? And if we make the problem bigger, then we get scaled parallelism. You essentially break through Amdahl's law and you get scaled parallelism. Great, now we can get our performance. But I haven't talked to you, I haven't told you about performance yet, I've only talked to you about parallelism. So let's talk about performance. Uh, complexity, versus performance. Complexity only tells you how hard the problem is, okay? Performance tells you how uh, much speed up opportunities there are from parallelism. It, is, it essentially gives you a way to quantify the effect of putting this problem onto some system and actually getting speed up. Parallelism gives you those opportunities for speed up. So performance, what is it? it, it, it it's, it's the computational requirements. There are really two parts. What does this problem need from a computational point of view to get that problem done? Um, and then it asks, what kind of resources do you, do you have available to do this? Here are my requirements, okay, uh, execute it. What kind of resources do you have to execute these to implement these requirements, these computational requirements. So when we evaluate performance, we want to understand really the relationship you know, between the computational requirements, what needs to be done, and what are the resources that you have to do it. And so we evaluate performance relative to metrics that we can talk about, like if I'm gonna implement some, in, uh, some in operation, I need some you know, instructions to do that, so maybe a metric is instructions per second. If I have some arithmetic operations I need to do, maybe a good metric might be operations per second. Scientific computations use floating point operations, and so typically we talk about those in terms of flops, which is a nice, cool name. Flops, floating point operations per second. Now, if I have some machine that's executing these operations, I can talk about how many operations could that particular machine do? And we'll say that's the peak performance on the machine. But the achieved performance is actually what is delivered for this problem. Problems can be different. They have different computational requirements. They can be serial, they can be parallel, they can be, they had differences, which is the nature of those problems. Okay, now we're at the point where we've got to make things real. You know, we've been talking about theory and this and that, right? We need to make things real. Uh, let's make things real. So what is a computer? What's a supercomputer? Well, when we talk about computational power, right, we need to realize that power in a real system that's going to execute those operations for these problems and, and really, you know, show me what you got. Right? A high performance computer system is one that tries to use the latest state of the art in technology for hardware and software in order to implement a machine to execute those operations. A supercomputer is the one that tries to do it the best, essentially. It's considered to be the system that has the highest performance possible. Using the state of the art, using you know, what we can do right now is you know, what we can build in a machine we need to quantify this. We need to understand, you know, what's a supercomputer and have a way to evaluate that. Then we might ask, what can supercomputers do? You gotta start uh, with the technology, okay? The technology is what we build computers from. The technology is interesting. Here is the technology as seen by the number of transistors that we can put uh, on an integrated circuit. This is called Moore's Law. And it's, it's hard to read, but what you see here, uh, and you can't read, are essentially the microprocessors that have been developed 
uh, for this number of transistors. And you should immediately see that this is a uh, logarithmic scale. So it is increasing by powers of 10 at each of these uh, 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 tick marks. And Moore's law says essentially that the number of transistors uh, is doubling every year. Transistors uh, translate to ability to do things. Those get implemented in microprocessors. Those microprocessors execute instructions, operations, and whatever, right? And this is the year of introduction. This is essentially a technological um, evaluation of computational power. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, tells you what is available in the technology. It gets really kind of interesting. You know, from a technology, technological point of view, you, you have people out there trying to build computers. How, you know, how do you build them? And uh, how, you know, you know, powerful can you make them? Uh, you know, it, are there any limits? I mean, you know, what's happening when you're adding more and more transistors to the integrated circuit, so you're also doing it with, with finer and finer line widths between those transistors on that integrated circuit. And at some point, you know, it's going to get hard. What gets hard? Well, this shows you a curve of the number of transistors here at the top. We saw that before. It just keeps going up. It's kind of crazy. Um, at some point, maybe that there will be the end of Moore's Law. You might have read that in the pub popular press. But there's other things shown here. One is the relative performance uh, here. That's on this curve. Another is the clock speed. Now, look at this line. And look at the clock speed here. That's also increasing. But at some point, it starts to fall off. Why? Uh, because, essentially, is that as you increase the clock speed, you end up increasing the power as well. There's other reasons for increased power. You know, you got a lot of transistors on there, and you know they're all kind of active and depending on the architecture and so forth. But at some point, things are really getting hot. They're getting hot, and you just can't increase the computational you know, capability of this microprocessor because it's too hot. <laughs> you can't cool it, and it's serious. It's serious, so what do you do? You know, in an integrated um, processor, you know, microprocessor manufacturers, they want to continue to sell you new processors. That's how they make their money. So what do they do? You know, they switch from a single core to now multiple cores that allow multiple instruction streams to be executed at the same time. That's how they do it. It was a necessary thing to do in terms of being able to build these devices, but what happens? Suddenly, parallelism becomes very important um, for processors. How do I implement, how do I support parallel execution? And I better be able to get that parallel execution. This is the technology uh, that we see. Th these are some of the things that are happening with respect to that technology. But, you know, technology is te technology. We're building supercomputers. <laughs> We're not just having a single CPU. We want to have a big, you know, macho machine. We want to have a big system. How do we do that? How do we build it? How do we evaluate it? Well, we go out and try to build it. You know, the way that we evaluate it is that we throw a problem at that machine and we say, how big of a problem can you solve? How fast can you solve it? And that's what has been happening over the last uh, many years. Um, there is a, a benchmarking uh, methodology that has been implemented uh, and by a essentially community that uh, essentially ranks the top 500 supercomputing systems in the world. It's called the top 500. The benchmark problem is a linear of system, a linear system of equations. You know, AX equal B. Um, you can you can scale that. You can make that really big where you have a really large number of unknowns in these equations, and that's what they do. They scale this problem to, to the biggest size you can on the supercomputer. And then they tell you R max, which is the maximum performance that can be achieved with this benchmark. It's called LINPAC. 
They tell you what the peak performance is, which is easy to calculate, and they tell you how big of a problem it is that you're able to compute. The interesting thing is to look at the curve. This is the curve of the top supercomputing system, the most powerful in terms of performance uh, machine, real computer system, all the way dating back to 1940, but the top 500 starts to pick up here around 1960, or at least recording, recording of this performance. And what do you see? Well, one thing you see is that now you have another log uh, scale. Not only is the trend, number of transistors increasing logarithmically, <laughs> but the power in terms of performance of the top supercomputing system in the world is increasing in a logarithmic way. Well, a couple of things. Uh, William mentioned Cedar. There's Cedar, about 1990. Here's a Cray YMP. You know, I was in uh, at University of Illinois during this time. That was the first supercomputing system that I used. But we're out to here, from here over a span of 30 years, and these machines are really uh, daunting. This shows you a different curve. This is the top 500. The one at the top, the curve at the top, is that if you sum all the performance of the 500 machines listed, that's the curve you get. Again, again, this is a log curve. The blue one is the top machine in the world, and these others are, is, is the number 500 machine. It's impressive. Now, you're going back here to 1999 um, to 2019. Well, we don't have machines there yet. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at 20 years, 20 years, 2018 years. And you have a machine here that is running at 93 petaflops. That's a lot. Um, uh, a petaflop is 2 to the... 17th, sorry, 10 to the 17th. I made that mistake the other day at <laughs> the Fulbright meeting that we were having. It's 10 to the 17th, 93 10 to the, times 10 to the 17th. That's a per second, floating point operations per second. I tried to do a calculation with a number of people in, in the world, uh, and if uh, every second for the next, for the whole extent of their lifetime, for every second, they did a floating point calculation. All the people in the world, right? Uh, then uh, it would, they would uh, be about two times the power you know, of, of that machine, which does the, those amount of operations in a single second. This is the top 10 machines. And the impressive thing about this is that if you look at the number one, it's a it's not impressive that it's a Chinese machine. It's impressive that you add the next five machines up, and it gives you that performance. It was, it was a remarkable feat of engineering. Chinese used all their own technology to do this, uh, and they had applications that are solving real problems running on this machine. The other thing you notice is the number of cores, and again, uh, this is 10 million cores. This machine's a monster. And if you add up all the next nine, I guess, uh, they, they just get a little bit of, you know, to that point. This is a very large machine. And this just shows you how some of the top 500 is distributed across countries. Now I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back to talking about performance and in particular, parallel performance. So what do I do? What do I do in my research? What does William do in his research? Uh, we look at performance. Why? Well, because it's a, it's a hard thing to look at. Yeah, and in particular, we have to look at the performance of these big supercomputing class machines. And they have millions of cores. Um, how do you understand performance? What is, the perf what is performance? This is something that I've got interested in uh, from my PhD work. What's the, what's the nature of performance? What does it mean? 
Um, and in fact, there's some fundamental theoretical issues just having to do with performance. Performance is, is it's, 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 it's just, um, I was about to say, is, is different. You know, it's this um, thing that it's hard to get your head around sometimes. Um, it is something that you want to talk about, but the fact is, is that it involves so many different factors that it's difficult to talk about it. So you have to have some type of methodology to do that. Um, achieving performance on a real machine, what does that mean? It means that I have a problem, I want to run it on your machine, and I want to get good performance. You know, you know these, these problems that you saw previously, it was a single problem that got that 93 petaflops. It was the Linpat problem. But you might have another problem, and you want to run on that machine, okay? Uh, and you want to have good performance. So performance itself is wrapped up in an engineering process. I mean, how do I do this? How do I understand what the characteristics about my particular problem are in such a way that I can code it on that machine? I'm looking at it from the other side. I'm saying, okay, you did that. Now I'm going to tell you how well you did. I'm going to observe you know, your program in execution on that machine. I'm going to capture some data. I'm going to try to find out if you have some problems that affect your performance, and then I'm going to help you tune it. This is, this is a complicated process, you know, and it's one that involves some real fundamental issues, because if I'm going to look at your performance running on that machine, can I, can I do that in, in a way uh, that doesn't impact the actual execution? Because now I'm doing something. Now I'm looking at the system somehow, and so we have this thing called performance uncertainty, which has to do with the fact that when I observe a computer system running some application, I might actually be affecting the way that that application executes on that system. So I call that performance uncertainty. The observation will be intrusive. It might even change the system state. <coughs> And so I really don't know if what I'm looking at and getting back in terms of performance data is true or not. It's just like any other experimental method. When I use observation, there's the real truth lies just beyond the reach of what my observational tools are. And so that's what makes our research fun and interesting. We had this evolving you know, com supercomputing landscape we're, we're always trying to build some tools that measure performance on those new systems. They're always different, and we end up doing research that way and trying to do things. Um, in part, this is a good picture of what I'm trying to do. In the research that I do, I look at issues of performance observation. How do I measure on real systems? I get performance uh, data. And it might be that I need to run a bunch of experiments in order to ca characterize what it is that I'm seeing, condense it into the different properties that help me to identify problems. I do diagnosis. I build technology to do all this. And that's what we've done uh, for the last 30 years. Looking at performance, there's different eras in which certain types of problems are more difficult to solve. Uh, with the types of methodologies and tools that we're developing. I've tried to label these in, in a way uh, so that you've got something to you know, think about here. And all along, uh, I've developed a system called the Tau Performance System. Now, we're here. This is where we are right now. And what's happening right now is, is things are getting a little crazy. You saw some of that craziness in terms of the actual hardware technology that is used to build microprocessors going from single cores to multiple cores and now multiple cores is in everything my cell phone has multiple cores your your cell phone has multiple cores for sure it's in everything now so we're having to deal with things that have to do with that we're having to deal with things that have to do with building really big systems to go after the next um, you know, big uh, um, performance number. And the next one 
is, is at X scale. Okay. I've told you, I've, I've taken you from Turing machines all the way up to the biggest supercomputing systems in the world just to emphasize that that, that machine from China, the 93 petaflop machine, is, has the same computational power uh, as a Turing machine. Now, I find that remarkable. I'll give you another little bit of a teaser. You know, when you look at a Turing machine and you ask about what is it capable of doing, there's, no, there's nothing in terms of a particular problem, some algorithm that's going to run on that machine. What are you talking about? You're talking about steps that have to be done, but you're not talking about things like time. You're not talking about things like flops. You're, you're not talking about those things. So it's like all I'm talking about is that there's a certain number of steps that you have to do, and, and the Turing machine will be able to do it. So, so what's supercomputers? They are essentially the reality, the present day reality of Turing machines. They have to be implemented in some way in our, in our physical world. They have to be implemented in some way. Now, prior, you know, prior to Turing's paper in 1936, there was nothing that does that, except for things like calculators, physical mechanical calculators. Uh, you know, they're not executing programs that implement algorithms and, and solve problems or anything like that. They're not, nothing like that is happening. But now, once he invented a Turing machine, suddenly everything is calculable. And we're just trying to do it in the best possible way that we can, okay? Now, those problems, you might say, well, so what? You know, I can build some big machine and it runs this, uh, you know, Linpack uh, benchmark, so, so what? Well, we want to use it to solve problems. What types of problems? Any problem, any problem that you can think of as being uh, in an algorithm, that you have steps, that you, you know, process data, that you compute things, that you do operations, anything like that, and that's where things become magic. That's where you think about you know, how you apply this to really addressing challenges that are part of your life. Well, uh, in the past, we turned to theoretical models to, to do things like this, right? Uh, formal systems and abstract models to reason through proofs. We moved to experimental science where we you know, looked at the nature, natural phenomena. We did experiments. You try to learn from those experiments, you know, to reason from the design as well as from the results. Um, then we got computers and things started to be really oriented towards what can I do computationally to model complex phenomenon that might be difficult uh, to come up with a theoretical model about, might be difficult to actually do an experiment. You know, and it's through simulation and modeling, through computation, that we're now you know, addressing those problems, those complex problems. And it's, gener it's driven by what we can do in terms of producing high-performance computers. We are entering a, a, a new world in which we have a large amount of data that we can access through sensors, through uh, other means. It's coming at us full, full force. We want to process that information, and we call this a data intensive. These are the four paradigms or pillars of science um, that have been talked about. Um, and most recently, it's the data intensive that is really driving a lot uh, of computer, um, uh, computers and, and how they're being used. We'll use the general term e-science as a way to, to characterize this. Well, if you don't think computation means anything, you know, just take a look at the number of computational science journals. And they're all over the place. Uh, I, I like this one, the computational political science. I'm hoping that that helps us in, in the uh, current reality. Uh, but it's all over the place. Sure, you know, there is, there, HPC matters, computational science matters, data intensive science, it matters. And the one way to get a handle on this is to take a look at what's happening in the community. Um, 
since uh, 1988. Um, the supercomputing conference uh, series has, has occurred every year. I have a distinction among, uh, I think, about 18 other people of having gone to every single one of these conferences since 1988, where Seymour Cray gave the keynote talk. It was the greatest keynote talk I've ever heard. Uh, and it's a huge conference. If you want to see what computation means and what it does, you know, go to this conference. It's an eye opener. Um, the technical program is the heart of it, but they have tutorials and presentations and panels and everything. They have prizes uh, awarded to the top uh, applications run on supercomputing, supercomputers. And they have a forum that just started called HPC Matters. Uh, that was very interesting this last time because it talked about precision medicine and it, and it, and it showed you know, how important it is for supercomputing, high performance computing in, in precision medicine. So if I take a look at the Golden, Gordon Bell Award winners, you can just kind of see. Uh, so atmospheric dynamics, heterogeneous flow in the Earth's mantle. These are solving real problems at scale, at, the, at scale on the biggest machines you know, in the world. It is necessary to be able to solve these problems by running on those machines. Uh, molecular dynamics, cloud gravitation that says cavitation, it might even be cavitation, no, no. Uh, ca cavitation collapse in body simulation, uh, brain blood flow simulation, interesting, right? Uh, biofluidics, this is my, this is my uh, coolest one. The cat is out of the bag. You know, cortical simulations with 109 neurons of, of a cat. Interesting. Uh, all of these are requiring uh, the, 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 the biggest syst systems you know, in the world. This goes all the way back. And you, you can just look at these and, and, sh and you see HPC, you know, HPC matters. So what's happening now? What's happening now is that uh, there are initiatives you know, throughout the world, in the United States is what I'm looking at right here on this slide, but throughout the world who, who, who you know, they, they understand this. They understand, you know, that competitiveness uh, is uh, in part, you know, founded on how well you support, you know, science and engineering, you know, with, within, your, within your country. Um, and in the world, what's important for that is computing. Is high performance computing you know, to do the types of things that we've traditionally done with large scale simulation, but also to start to do things that are associated with the types of operations, types of problems, you know, types of calculations that are necessary for large scale data analysis, and and to and to really get aggressive as to how you can couple all these things, all these areas together. You know, the advancement of science and engineering you know, requires this. <laughs> and it requires exascale class systems. So the national in initiatives that based upon supercomputing, one uh, from the President Obama, the National Strategic Computing Initiative, it has as part of that initiative, which I'll talk about here in a second, exascale computing. Um, there was an initiative earlier looking at the brain and what things that were, are necessary for that. I'm not gonna talk about that. And there's other ones that are also in, a part of this uh, National Strategic Computing Initiative uh, for looking at uh, problems like cancer, where the computational you know, complexity of the, of the types of solutions you know, are just beyond what it is that we can do today. But if we can do those things uh, at a level uh, of exascale, we might be able to make progress. Um, the N NSCI started in July 2000. And 15, and it really is, I love this term, whole of nation. It's a whole of nation. It's every, every you know, aspect that you can think about you know, coming to bear on trying to advance uh, the, the United States in high performance computing. And in particular, to do so by focusing on building um, large scale uh, machines, advanced technology, and applying them to scientific discovery and competitiveness. The main themes are, are, are shown here, um, but the one in particular that is, that is important is to deliver exascale computing technology. 
Um, and so what was launched by the Department of Energy as the lead organization was an exascale computing project. I have some funding off of this project. This is a three plus billion dollar project over the next three to five to five years to try to advance um, computing science and technology you know, to a level that exascale class systems can be, can be produced. Exascale, two, sorry, say two, 10 to the 18th. You know, flops per second is, 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 is huge. Um, DOE is the lead organization here, but there's a lot of others you know, that, that are involved. Um, it's a cross entire ecosystem focus, um, but it's going after these challenges. You can identify problems in astrophysics and chemi chemical science, uh, climate change, nuclear energy, wind energy, all of these things that have exascale computing requirements. And over the next three years, you know, what the DOE hopes to do is to be in a position where there is uh, a, an ability to go out and build this level of resource. Uh, and other countries around the world are looking at similar, very similar problems. One of the problems that is identified under the National Strategic Computing Initiative uh, is cancer. And there's a, a partnership between DOE and the National Cancer Institute to look at this problem and to look at it from a point of, of view of developing precision on, on, oncology to address um, aspects of that problem that some are computational, some are large data uh, and need large data types of analytics you know, and, and learning uh, to be done. And others are l looking at how uh, to get information when you start to look at, at, at um, applying you know, population-wide uh, um, treatments. And so it's hard to uh, see some of these slides, but uh, I wanted to focus in on one in particular on this next one that has to do with um, molecular dynamics, in which is essentially computational chemistry and doing so, it's hard to see across different scales, different scales, multi-scale computational chemistry. I had a PhD student who just graduated uh, in December, and this was his thesis topic, looking at how to address large atom, large molecule size systems that we can't address now using methods of multi-scale analysis. David Ozog is, is uh, the name of the student and he's now uh, working at, at Intel. What you see here, it's hard to see, but this whole, this whole problem is, is more than just doing molecular dynamics. It is you know, looking at the results that come from experiments in terms of large scale data that needs to be processed and you trying to learn from that information, learn from that data uh, in order to see what works and what the features are within uh, that data that, that will put you more on a path uh, to, actual, to actually solving this problem. Here's my last slide. And um, I titled it, I just came up with this about 30 minutes before William decided to take, bring me over here. Because you know, the way that I think about this sometimes is a little bit philosophical. Um, you know, what we can do now, right now, <laughs> in time, uh, is you know, defined you know, by the, the knowledge that we built up and the technology that we built up and, and applying that in a very real way. Okay. That doesn't define what is possible. And in fact, you know, when we think about computers, uh, I would I, I'd tell anybody you know, uh, that computers are as close to pure, I, I call it pure invention. They're as close to pure invention as, as, you'll, as you'll get. Because I didn't tell you everything about Turing machine. There's one thing that you probably should think that I didn't tell you about. And that's the algorithm. That's the, that's, the, that's the encoding of a problem in an algorithm. But think about what I told you in the beginning. You know, Turing machine, who is the computer? You're the computer. You're, Turing, in the, his original formulation, it was you. You were doing that. So it's your knowledge. It's, it's your ideas. It's, it's what you imagine. 
you know, that gets encoded into an algorithm that will run, because you know it will run, because it's computable, on a Turing machine. And if it runs on a Turing machine, it will run on these big monsters. Maybe, you have to think about parallelism, you have to think about these other things and so forth, but it's, it's, it's you. Now, I find that remarkable. You know, it is what it is that I can imagine and, and, and actually translate into some form that then it's like it's done. You know, if I can think about it, then you know, at some point I'm gonna have a machine that actually will be able to implement it. We live in a finite window of time, but these things, I point to that, they're beyond time. They are there. They're, they're, it's, not like, it's, it's not like anything else in our world. They're there. And all you got to do is to come up with a solution approach in the form of an algorithm that's going to run on it. And if it doesn't run at an exascale today, it will run at an exascale 10 years from now. You better believe it. So what's in the box? You know, uh, what do you think is in the box? Come on. What have I been talking about? That's a finite state machine. It's a Turing machine. Here's my Turing machine. Here's my, you know, there you go. Here's my infinite tape. That's the only thing that you have to imagine that is, you know. And here's my cell. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I need something to erase something, and I need something to write something onto this. That's, that's it. But this is you. This is you. So I compute, therefore I am. It, it is you that is making this possible. We have uh, the model. The model is right there. The model is, is, is different from anything else that you can imagine. Um, and it's, it's in our world. It's there. It's there. It's, it, and it's manifested in all the computers that we use today. But what's 10 years from now? What's 100 years from now? So when you look at problems, I don't know, I'm going to probably stop here in a second, but I'll make a, make a, a statement, you know, is that it's, it's hard to talk about, um, you know, what's true, what's, what's true and what's possible, you know, without having a full conception that you can actually do the impossible. And so when we have problems today, and, and we should ask, you know, can we solve these problems? Through computation. Yeah, I think there's a lot of problems that we can solve through computation. You know, why do we, why do, we do climate modeling? Why do we do that? You know, just for fun? <laughs> we do climate modeling so that we can better understand the world that we live in and we can think about the types of problems that we have with respect to, those, to that world. And we can use those models because it's hard to do experiments on climate you know, you can go off and measure the data and so forth. But if you want to go 10 years into the future now, then how do you do that? Well, you use computers. You know, we need to believe in that power and we need to be able to apply that through that power by investing into it. We need to invest in it because it is the future of, uh, of, um, of our science. It's the future of our, our mankind. That's how we're gonna solve problems. With that, I'm going to stop. Sure.